Our next up on our agenda is Steve Parks of Star Dundee presenting a space fiber workshop. And so, Steve, are we going uh, directly to your uh, video or are you introducing a few things first? I'll, I'll just say a couple of words. So, uh, okay. f uh, first of all, uh, thanks very much, Brandon. Um, so my name is Steve Parks from Star Dundee. I'm going to uh, present a, a space fiber tutorial. Unfortunately, the um, the upload speed from uh, rural Scotland um, is not sufficient for me to do this live. So I prepared a video which we'll, we will run uh, just now. And uh, I will, however, be available for questions. So uh, I look forward to those. Thanks very much. If we could start the video now. Thank you so much, Steve. Hello, my name's Steve Parks from Star Dundee. I'm going to present a tutorial on space fibre. So first, a brief introduction to space fibre. Space fibre is the next generation of space wire technology, which is very high performance. It runs at 6.25 gigabits per second per lane and higher depending on the SIRDES speed. It runs over electrical or fibre optic cables. Um, over electrical uh, cables, it will run a few meters at 6.25 gigabits per second, and space fiber operates over 100 meters of fiber optic cable. It has multi lane capability to increase bandwidth, so a quad lane link at 6.25 gigabits per second per lane gives 25 gigabits per second per link, and we could have a maximum of 16 lanes. There's rapid graceful degradation on lane failure so that the, the link will keep running even though uh, part of the link has failed, um, it will keep running with reduced bandwidth. And we can support asymmetric traffic with unidirectional lanes, so you can have more lanes running in one direction than in the other direction, providing that at least one lane is bidirectional. There are low latency broadcast messages, which can be used for time distribution, synchronization, event signaling, error notification, and so on. Space Fiber has a novel quality of service capability. It supports up to 32 virtual channels, each having uh, bandwidth reservation, priority, and scheduling. Those virtual channels can be used to construct virtual networks, um, and each of those virtual, virtual networks operates as an independent network over a single physical network. There's fault detection isolation recovery capability. This is provided at the link level, enable, enabling rapid error recovery, which just takes a few microseconds. Uh, we support babbling node and virtual channel protection. And as I've said, there's graceful degradation in the event of a failure of a lane in a multi-lane link. Space Fiber has a small footprint, so it takes just a few percent of a recent radiation tolerant FPGA to implement a highly capable Space Fiber interface. And it's straightforward to integrate um, Space Fiber with existing space wire equipment because they use the same packet format and its same addressing scheme. The multi-lane link technology of Space Fiber is patented by Star Dundee, but we provide a free of charge license for space applications to this technology. This mission is one of the first uh, spacecraft to fly Space Fiber. Um, OPSAT from uh, ESA, which was an experimental spacecraft, and this chip was one of the first uh, chips to incorporate uh, Space Fiber. Um, this is the Ramon chip's RC64 uh, DSP processor. It has 64 DSP cores and 12 space fiber links for interconnecting the chips together and taking data in and out of the, uh, the, the chips. Space fiber standard was published by the ECSS in May 2019 and space fiber is being integrated into the space VPX standard VITA 78 as both a control and data plane technology. I'm now going to talk about Space Fiber packets and routing switches. So Space Fiber uses the um, same format packets as SpaceWire. Uh, this, the packets start with a destination address, which can be either the path to a destination node, so that comprises a string of, of uh, data characters 
describing that path through the network, or it can be the identity of a destination node. So just the single data character re which represents the identity of the node. After the destination address, there's the cargo. So that's the data or message to be transferred from the source to the destination. And the cargo can be anything in any format that uh, you require. The packet's completed by an end of packet marker. Um, and that can either be a normal end of packet marker or an error end of packet marker, which indicates that something went wrong with the packet as it was going through the network. A routing switch comprises several link interfaces together with a, a routing switch matrix. And Spacewire and Spacefiber both use wormhole routing. Um, where the leading data character of a packet is used as a destination address or destination identifier. And we support the path and logical addressing. Um, when a port, um, an output port is uh, required to be used by more than one um, input port, the, um, uh, those two ports, there's, there's arbitration which decides who's going to access the output of the, uh, the port. So just to describe wormhole routing. So um, here we've got a router with a couple of nodes. Um, the node sends out a, a packet and at the front of that is the, the first byte of the packet, which is the first, ad uh, the address uh, of the packet. When that arrives at the router, it checks that header byte and requests the, um, the appropriate output port. Um, so that, uh, that packet then gets routed through the appropriate output port towards the destination. And it's like a worm wriggling its way through the uh, routing switch. So the, the, the input port and output port are connected together and the packet just continues to fl fl flow through the router and, until um, the end of packet marker um, goes through the output port and frees that output port. After that, that output port can be used by another packet. So the advantages of wormhole routing are that it doesn't need any packet buffering. It, so it uses very little uh, buffer memory. Um, and it can also support packets of arbitrary size. Um, and the switching can be rapid. The disadvantage is that if the output port is not ready, you have to wait. And that will block all the links being used um, for the waiting packet. So here's a, an example of that. We have a, a routing switch and a packet arriving at any link input can be switched to any link output. So here we have packet arriving at port one gets switched to output port four, from three gets switched to output port one, and arriving at port two, it gets switched to output port three. So all of these can go on in parallel. Um, and then if we have a, a packet arriving at port four, which wants to go out of port one, it's then stopped because the output port the uh, output of port one is already being used so we have to wait until the packet going out of port one is finished and then we can carry on sending that packet from port four okay i now want to talk about uh, the different addressing schemes so first of all path addressing so the path address describes the route to the destination um, and here I've got a, a diagram showing basically a road system and we've got some roundabouts or junctions on that, that road with each um, uh, road coming off the junction numbered. So um, to reach the destination, um, we just uh, need to be told which, um, which exits we've got to use from each of the roundabouts to reach the destination. So in this case, um, we go at the first roundabout we go um, out of exit two the second roundabout at exit one and the third roundabout exit three so two one three is the route through the network so here we see this with uh, uh, a space fiber um, set of routing switches so we have a source and a destination node and we put our um, header on the packet which is two one three as we've just described so when we when that packet arrives at the first routing switch two is at the front so it says okay that's a path address and i'm going to route out of uh, 
uh, port two. So the packet goes out of port two and that leading byte has been used so it gets discarded. And then we arrive at the next routing switch and we've got one is at the front, so we go out of port one, the one gets discarded, we arrive at the third routing switch, three is at the front, and so we go out of port three and we arrive at the destination with that uh, path address at the front of the packet having been removed. So for logical addressing, we simply use signposts at each of the, each of the routing switches and uh, just follow the signs, in this case, to Dundee. Okay, so looking at that in uh, space wire or space fiber terms, um, we put a number, um, we, we, we give Dundee a, an identifier, which is 44 represents Dundee. So we put that number at the front of the, um, the packet. So 44, then the cargo and the end of packet marker. When that arrives at the first routing switch, it gets looked up in a routing table, which has been programmed beforehand. And so we have 44 Dundee, it says go out of exit two. So we leave uh, out of port two. Um, and we this time we keep that number 44 at the front because we're gonna need that for the next uh, uh, router. So at the next router, um, 44, we look that up and it says go out of port one. And then finally at the third routing switch, it says um, use ex exit three. And the packet arrives at the destination with that um, logical address um, at the front of the the uh, of the packet. Okay, so how do we differentiate between path addresses and logical addresses? Because um, they're just the first byte of the the packet that we're using. So um, the first thing is that uh, we have um, a special address which is zero, which represents a um, a configuration port. So port zero on a routing switch is an internal port which is used for configuring, controlling and monitoring the routing switch. So if the leading byte is zero, we'll just route the packet to that internal port. If the leading byte is um, in the range of one through to 31, then that represents a path address. So um, address one goes to port one, address two to port two and so on. If it's in the range 32 up to 254, then it's a logical address. And then we have to program the routing table with which port we want it, uh, we want the packet to go out of. So in this case, I've programmed port one, uh, the address 32 to go out of port one, address 33 to go out of port two, and address 34 to go out of port four. And uh, address 255 is a reserved address. Okay, so now just to look at the arbitration. Um, so a link interface comprises an input port and an output port, and a packet arriving at port four and being looped back for some reason back to uh, port, back out of port four. Um, if that arrives, it can just be routed straight out of the output port. And while that, port, while that packet is being transferred, um, a couple of other packets arrive. And they both want to, they both want to go out of port four as well, but they can't because port four is being used, so they have to wait. When the packet going out of port four has finished, then the two packets that are waiting, um, there's arbitration that goes on to decide who's going to get the uh, access to the output port, and that's done through a fair arbitration scheme. Okay, so we've looked at the packet routing and the path addressing. So here's a few questions just to um, uh, go through and understand the uh, the packet routing. Um, so first of all, we want to get from node one to node three on this network. So there's a few nodes here and a couple of routing switches. So how do we get from node one to node three? So what's the path address for that? So when we get to router, one, we want to go out of port three. So we simply add three to the front. If we want to get from node two to node six, there's a couple of ways we can do, do this. So we can go, when we get to the, the first router from node two, router one, we want to go out of port four and then out of port five. 
or alternatively we can go out of port at uh, router one we can go out of port five and then out of port five of uh, the second routing switch and if we want to go around the network and back again to, to node one we can do something like go out of port and uh, router router one we go out of port five router two we go out of port two router one we go out of port one and we're back at node one so that's basically the the way that the um, path addressing scheme works I'm going to describe space fiber links, lanes, and data link frames. So a space fiber link is made up of one or more lanes. The lanes carry the information from one end of the link to the other end. Those space fiber lanes can run over electrical physical layer or a fiber optic uh, physical layer. A multi-lane link can have some unidirectional lanes provided that at least one lane is bidirectional. The link layer provides the quality of service and the error recovery capabilities of space fiber. If we look at a space wire interface, it has a packet interface, a timecode interface, and a management interface. And then at the outside, we've got a serial interface sending the space wire signals out of the space wire interface. The space fiber interface is similar. It has a number of virtual channel interfaces and each of those is each virtual channel is similar to a pair of space wire FIFOs um, and they can be used to send and receive space fiber packets. Then there's a broadcast interface which is similar to a space wire time code interface um, but it's more extensive so we can broadcast short messages we can distribute time we can do synchronization event signaling and error handling using the broadcast interface and then there's the management interface which uh, manages and configures and controls rec records status information um, for the space fiber interface so if we have a look at the um, uh, a lane so there's the near end of the lane the physical medium and then the far end of the lane and that provides basically a, a, a basic um, uh, throughput for the for the link um, and then we've got the link layer at the near end and the link layer at the far end and as part of those links we have a virtual channel interface so virtual channel zero at one end and virtual channel zero at the other end packets that are put into the virtual channel interface travel across the the link um, through the lane uh, re received at the far end and they pop out of the same virtual channel at, uh, number at the far end and if you put something in at the far end a packet in at the far end it will come out of the virtual channel at the near end and we can have a number of these virtual channels that um, all operate in parallel to improve performance we can add lanes so as you add lane if you add another lane you've doubled the performance and, and so on so that basically increases the bandwidth of the the basic link the part between the lanes is actually the physical layer then we have a lane or multi-lane layer then there's the data link layer and finally beyond that the part that's sending and receiving packets is the is the um, the network layer so the network deals with packets the data link deals with frames the lane and multi-lane layer deal with symbols and the physical layer deals with the transfer of bits across the physical medium so virtual channels um, are used by the links to um, to transport packets so the links carry packets through the virtual channels there are a maximum of 32 virtual channels which are numbered consecutively from zero. Traffic entering virtual channel N at one end of the link comes out of virtual channel N at the other end of the link. And each virtual channel is independent. It's given some quality of service characteristics, so a bandwidth allocation, um, and it has to stay within that bandwidth, as we'll see later. It's given a priority and can also be scheduled. These three quality of service parameters work together to determine the precedence of one virtual channel over another. So who's gonna send the next frame of information? 
Space Fiber provides error recovery at the link level. So um, here's our link. If we have a transient error occurring on uh, the, the link, um, that gets detected using disparity invalid codes or CRC. And the information that's on the line when the error um, is the error uh, occurs is resent automatically. That maintains the state of the link without a lengthy reset process, and it contains the error in the link. It takes just around about three microseconds to recover from a transient error on a space fiber um, link, including resending the uh, information. So the error is contained within the link where it occurs. If we've got a multi-lane link, um, then when a persistent or a permanent error on a lane occurs, the error is detected, and then we can reconfigure the, um, the lanes in the link. So to remove the lane that has, has failed. So very quickly, we can continue operating with the remaining lanes. And because we've got quality of service, the high priority um, data has precedence and it will get sent in preference to the uh, lower priority lane. So the virtual channel that's got lowest priority will be the one that loses information. The high priority, maybe critical control information, will still be able to get through the, um, the link even though we've lost one of the lanes. It takes just a, two microseconds to reconfigure once the error has been, dete error has been detected. And we can also um, add in uh, cold spares or hot redundant lanes, which are not normally active, or with a hot, hot one, it's actually there active, but not sending data. And they can be sw uh, switched in when an error occurs so that you don't lose any um, bandwidth for the link. Okay, so space fiber fault detection, isolation, and recovery capability um, uh, is split into the fault detection. So we've got the parity, disparity of the 8B, 10B codes. We uh, look for invalid 8B, 10B codes, and we also have CRC um, on many of the, um, the pieces of information that are being sent across the link. We provide fault isolation. So first of all, there's galvanic isolation at the physical level using series capacitors. Um, there's enhanced hamming distance between control codes to make sure a single bit flip doesn't cr doesn't transfer one control code into another one. Um, we've got uh, uh, data framing to provide time containment. Uh, we've got virtual channels to provide bandwidth containment. And the error, any error that occurs, is isolated within the link in which it occurs. So fault recovery is done at the link level. Um, we get graceful degradation on the lane failure. There's babbling no protection built in as well. And of course, we have error reporting. Um, so status registers in routing switches and in interfaces, which can be interrogated to report errors. So now I want to describe the, uh, the data link frames. So um, Space Fiber uses 32-bit control words and data words. And a data frame um, is a series of control words and data words which basically carry packets or parts of packets. So here you can see a data frame is made up of a start of data frame um, and a data field, which is up to 64 words uh, in a single lane link, and then an end of data frame. The start of data frame begins with a comma, which is used for synchronization has a start of data frame identifier to say this is the start of data frame, the virtual channel number for, to indicate which virtual channel this data frame belongs to, and then there's a reserved field as well for future expansion. The end of data frame has uh, an end of data frame identifier, a sequence number, and a 16-bit CRC uh, for detecting errors. There's also broadcast frames, which are the low latency frames that um, uh, can be sent uh, across a, a complete network, broadcast across the network, carrying a broadcast message. So the start of a broadcast frame, again, has a comma for synchronization, a start of broadcast frame identifier, the broadcast channel uh, that this broadcast 
uh, message belongs to and the type of broadcast message, for example, whether it's a time message or some other sort of message. Then we have eight bytes of information that, that are contained within the uh, broadcast message and then an end of broadcast frame. So um, the, we have the end of broadcast frame, the uh, status field, sequence number and a CRC. There's also a start of, um, there's also an idle frame, which when we're not sending any data frame or broadcast frame, we send an idle frame. And that basically starts off with the start of, start of idle frame marker, just to indicate that this is an idle frame. But there's, um, then we've got a series of pseudo random um, words, and, uh, and then there is no idle frame uh, marker. So if you want to terminate an idle frame, it's terminated by a start of data frame or a start of broadcast frame. And the other thing that's important at the link level is flow, flow control. And we have a flow control token, which is exchanged for a number of data words. So when you receive a data, uh, a flow control token, uh, you can then send a certain number of data words to the far end um, and be assured that there's room in the buffer at the far end for that data. So the flow control token has a start of, is, it's identified as a flow control token. There's then a, um, uh, a multiplier and virtual channel number, and then a sequence number and CRC. So if we look at what we can put inside a data frame, uh, the data field can contain data characters, end of packet markers, error end of packet markers, and fill characters. Fill characters are used to fill out a data, fill out a word after an end of packet marker or error end of packet marker. So that enables each packet to be sent immediately without having to wait for a full frame. So here's an example with a starter data frame. Uh, the the uh, frame is full of data characters and then we've got an end of data frame. We can also have a start of data frame, some data and an end of packet marker and a, a data frame. Uh, if the end of packet marker doesn't line up neatly um, in the in the frame, then we can have some fill characters following the end of packet marker. And we can also put multiple packets or parts of packets in a frame. So here we've got data and end of packet marker. So that's the end of a packet. Then we've got some fills. Then we've got data and an end of packet marker, which is a complete packet. And then we've got the start of the next packet. So we've got some data and then the end of data frame. I will now talk about base fiber quality of service. First, I want to introduce the way that uh, frames and flow control tokens are multiplexed over a space fiber link. So um, over the space fiber link, we can send data frames, broadcast frames, flow control tokens. And if there's nothing else to send, we can send idle frames. So let's suppose we have a data frame that's uh, wants to be sent over the uh, the link, and we start to send that over the the link. And you can see that at the bottom there. And then, while we're in the process of sending that data frame, a broadcast frame uh, is ready to send. Now, the broadcast frames preempt data frames, so that will get inserted in the middle of the data frame, and um, and then be sent. And supposing then, in the meantime, a flow control token is ready to send. That also preempts the data frames, um, but it doesn't preempt broadcast frames. And so it gets inserted into the information being sent onto the link. Once that's gone, then we can carry on sending the rest of the data frame. Maybe another broadcast frame needs to be sent before we get to the, uh, before we finally sent the um, information in the data frame. Uh, so that will be sent. And finally, we get to send the rest of the data frame. Another data frame is ready to send. And, um, but before we can start doing that, another FCT needs to be sent. So that will get sent. We send some of the new, um, the new data frame. Then there's a broadcast frame that needs to be sent. Then we send the rest of that data frame. And now there's nothing to send. So we can send an idle frame. We send the idle frame, 
and then maybe there's some more data that uh, another data frame that needs to be sent and we can send that okay so this shows the way that we want to be able to multiplex the different types of information over the actual link as well as doing that we've got a number of different virtual channels and those virtual channels uh, will have different precedents and so on um, some may be ready to send their information others may not so we need to be able to send the information in an appropriate way uh, from a range of different virtual channels and the virtual channel controller does that to help with this we've got uh, we need to know um, if there's space available at the far end um, in a particular virtual channel buffer at the far end so that we can then send a frame to into that virtual channel buffer and know that there's space for it so we need to be able to receive these flow control tokens which tell us which virtual channels have got space at the far end there's also the flow control tokens that we need to send to tell the far end that we've got space in our receive um, virtual channel buffers um, and then we also need to be able to send broadcast messages so all of this information gets uh, multiplexed via a medium access controller and that finally decides which frame or broadcast message or fct is going to be sent over the over the space fiber link okay so if we concentrate now on the virtual channels um here we've got um three virtual channels with uh a medium access controller at one end and we're sending to the far end which has got a demultiplexer demultiplexing the information back into the three virtual channels so a virtual channel is ready when it's got some data to send so we've got a frame ready to send and when the destination virtual channel buffer has space in its buffer so if we've got something to send and there's space at the far end um, then we're basically ready to send and a virtual channel is able to send when it's ready and when its quality of service for that particular virtual channel results in the highest precedence compared to the other ready virtual channels. And a, a critical thing, um, a packet that's flowing through one virtual channel does not block another packet flowing through another virtual channel. Okay, so here we have virtual channel one. That's uh, ready to send nobody else is ready to send so virtual channel one can send a frame still nobody else is ready to send so it can send another frame now virtual channel two is ready to send and maybe it's higher precedence than virtual channel one so it sends the next frame now virtual channel one hasn't got anything else to send and in the meantime virtual channel three is ready to send um, so um, it sends a frame and then maybe um, it doesn't have any more space in its buffer at the far end so virtual channel one can send the next frame so we're multiplexing frames of information over the different virtual channels in this way okay so how do we decide the relative precedence of the different virtual channels that are ready okay and to do that we have a bandwidth uh, credit counter so um, the credit counter will um, determine the, pre the precedence of each um, uh, each virtual channel so let's have a look at that so here over time we're basically allocating giving the the a particular virtual uh, a virtual channel credit so it's allowed to increment its credit as time goes on it gets more and more credit and then when it sends a frame it spends some of that credit and if it sends another frame it spends more of that credit uh, that credit and then it keeps going accumulating credit all the time now if we have if we think about say three of these um, virtual channels all accumulating credit and spending credit then we end up with something like this um, so this red one maybe it's been allocated uh, 20 percent of the um, of the overall uh, bandwidth so when it spent when it sends a frame it drops um the uh the its precedence its accumulated credit by a certain amount and then the green one has maybe got 10 percent of the bandwidth so when it sends a frame it drops by twice the amount so it spends more credit to 
um, to send a frame because it's got lower bandwidth allocation. So we can allocate different bandwidths on for each of the virtual channels, and then that determines how much credit they have to spend in order to send another frame. When there are two virtual channels that both want to send at the same time, then it's the one with the highest precedence, so the blue one in this case, that will actually send the next frame of information. And it's possible that we um, accumulate credit and eventually our credit counter will reach a limit. So when we've got so much credit, then we basically saturate that credit and um, uh, we just stay at that saturated value until we start spending credit again. Okay, to add priority um, to this, we simply add, effectively add a couple of extra bits to the to the, the priority counter at the top. And, uh, and that gives us these, these three um, or, or more priority levels that we have in, in Space Fiber. So here you can see that priority one is always going to be the highest precedence and it has a, a credit counter which uh, is shown in yellow and it's going to accumulate credit but always it's got higher precedence than priority level two and prior le priority level two has higher precedence than priority level three. So priority one will always be able to send However, if it starts sending a lot, then eventually it will reach um, its lower limit. So it will have used up all its bandwidth allocation. Um, however, in this particular case, it's still got higher precedence than all of the other virtual channels. So it's possible it could keep sending data, even though it's used up all of its credit. So what happens is when a virtual channel reaches its lower level, it's automatically demoted to the lowest um, lowest level possible. So, um, and it, that means it can't, if other virtual channels have got information to send, priority one or other virtual channel cannot dominate. It can only stay within its allocated, um, allocated bandwidth. Okay, when priority um, one um, has accumulated some more credit, then of course it gets demoted, uh, it gets promoted back up again, and it can carry on um, uh, sending frames of information. So this actually provides a babbling node protection uh, mechanism. The other type of uh, quality of service that we have is scheduled quality of service. And this is to support deterministic data delivery for things like attitude and orbit control systems. So what we do is we split time into a series of time slots and they're separated by broadcast messages or synchronized in some way by broadcast messages. So here's an example. So we send broadcast message one, we have time slot one, broadcast message two, that ends that time slot, starts time slot two and so on. Okay, then we have a series of time slots and we can have up, actually up to 64 time slots and each virtual channel um, and that we can have up to 32 virtual channels. Here I've just got uh, seven of them. Um, each virtual channel is told which time slot it's allowed to send in. So here's an example configuration. So virtual channel one is allowed to send in time slot one. Virtual channel two can send in time slots two and six. Uh, virtual channel six and seven can both send in time slot three. And that means they will compete based on their precedence when time slot three comes along, but they're not allowed to send any other time. Now, if I don't want to use the schedule quality of service, then I can just configure all virtual channels to send in all time slots and they will just be able to, they will just compete on based on priority and the bandwidth reservation. So based on the precedence. I can have mixed quality of service where some uh, virtual channels are slotted, if you like, so they, they only work in time slots. So like virtual channel one and two in this case, so virtual channel one can send in only send in time slot one, virtual channel two can send in uh, time slot two or time slot five. And the other virtual channels, three through to seven, can send um, uh, in time slot three, four, six, seven and eight and they will compete based on their precedence. The problem with this is that if virtual channel one doesn't have anything to send in time slot one, 
then nobody else can send anything either. So we've wasted some bandwidth. So we basically changed this slightly, this model slightly to um, not waste bandwidth. So this is actually the, the final scheme that we've got. So here we have virtual channel one and two that um, they're given the very highest priority and they're given particular time slots that they're allowed to send in. And then the other virtual channels, they're basically going to compete based on their uh, precedents um, and they can send at any time. And but they're all given less than the highest priority. So when we come to time slot one, then obviously virtual channel one, it's got something to send, it's ready to send and um, its highest priority. So it's going to send the information. Maybe it finishes sending all that information and it's still not time slot one hasn't finished yet. So it's got nothing to send. So the other virtual channels, virtual channel three to seven, can then actually send information in that time slot. Then maybe virtual channel one has some more information to send. So it's still the highest priority. It's still in its time slot. So it can send some more information. In this way, we have uh, deterministic data delivery, so data being delivered in particular time slots, and we have um, no wasted bandwidth for the for the link or the network. Here's an example um, of our Starfire test equipment, actually looking at uh, data flame data frames from different virtual channels. So time is going down the screen, and on the left hand side we have uh, say the transmit direction and on the right hand side we've got the receive direction and then we've got broadcast channel and virtual channels two three four five six and seven um, all sending information so here you can see um, virtual channel five uh, sends a frame then it sends another frame then virtual channel two sends a frame and it happens to have an end of packet marker in that frame then we've got a broadcast frame being sent and then virtual channel six is sending a frame. So these, this just shows how data is being multiplexed over the, over the link from the different virtual channels. Okay, one other thing I just want to mention here is um, uh, carrying space wire over space fiber. So this shows a particular use of virtual channels. So it's very easy to connect a space wire link to a virtual channel. They literally bolt back to back. Um, and so we can have a space wire link connected to a virtual channel going through a space fiber link, you know, maybe a long distance across a spacecraft. And then there's a, a at the far end, um, we're coming out of that space fiber interface into a number of space wire links again. And as you can see, um, information that's flowing over virtual channel zero, the one at the bottom, will come from space wire link five through the space fiber link and out of space wire link one. It can't cross over to those other links, uh, the other space wire links. And similarly, space wire six goes to space wire two and so on. So this is a way of carrying lots of space wire links over a single physical space fiber link to save mass and uh, potentially power consumption and to also provide the quality of service of space fiber for space wire as well. So um, that's one particular application of, of using space wire in a very simple way and showing how easy it is to interface space wire and space fiber. I'm now going to describe an example architecture using space fiber. So this, this shows the architecture. There are two space fiber routers in this design, although we could actually do this with one space fiber router. There's uh, two, in two high data rate instruments, two low data rate instruments uh, using space wire, a control processor, a mass memory unit, and a downlink telemetry system. So we need a virtual channel um, to get data from instrument, instrument number one to the mass memory unit, another virtual channel to get data from instrument two to the mass memory unit, and then virtual channels to get data from the two space wire instruments into the mass memory. We need another virtual channel to get data from the mass memory unit to the downlink telemetry system, and a uh, 
a virtual channel, a virtual network to get um, for a control processor to control all of the um, space fiber equipment, all of the um, uh, the instruments and other electronic equipment, um, uh, configuring them, controlling them, and reading housekeeping information from them. So those virtual channels or virtual networks will run together um, over the same physical network without one being able to interfere with another. So we're building an example uh, network um, in a European Union uh, Horizon 2020 research project called HiSide. The space fiber routing switch um, and the related network technology is being developed by Star Dundee. Uh, you can see the routing switch here. This is being de developed to TRL6. It's, uh, it takes about 12.5 watts um, and it's uh, 4 inches by 4 inches by 3 inches roughly. So we have a space fiber camera that's providing data into the network. There's a, an instrument simulator for other hyperspectral data and other data. There's a control computer that's controlling the entire network, a mass memory unit developed by Airbus and Star Dundee, a data compress compression system developed by Airbus and NKUA, um, a high performance data processor chip developed by ISD, a, an RF downlink developed by TSAT with a, a high power amplifier uh, developed by Erzia and an optical downlink being developed by DLR. And all of this equipment has space fiber interfaces which run at up to 10 gigabits per second, providing a complete onboard uh, network running at high speed. All right. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, was there anything else you'd like to say or going straight into Q&A? Uh, let's, yeah, go into Q&A. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Uh, we, we have a few minutes for some questions and we got plenty queued up already. Uh, so first question from Alan Mick. Uh, what are the material properties of fiber used in space? What characteristics are important and or problematic? And what is the prevalence of fiber versus copper in space applications? Yeah, so um, if you'd asked that question five years ago, there wouldn't have been very much, but things have changed. So um, fiber for space is now becoming, uh, you know, more and more common. Um, and for data rates, let's say above 6.25 gigabits per second, it starts to become absolutely critical to use fiber optics. So if you've got lanes, lane speeds that are, you know, greater than 6.25 gigabits per second, then fiber optics is very, very attractive. It offers um, galvanic, iso galvanic isolation, so full galvanic isolation, lower cable mass, um, uh, very, very high performance and long distance. So up to 100 meters with with uh, space fiber. So, um, yeah, the, the transceivers are available in radiation hard technology. The fiber optic cable is, is available radiation hard now. Um, there are at least three or four vendors that are providing this technology. So, yeah, it's all good to go. So Great. we, we okay. okay, yeah, we, we expect we expect to see systems that are running with fiber optics at 40, 100 gigabits per second in the foreseeable future. OK, uh, next question from Tim Cannon. How does QoS interact with router arbitration? Yeah, so. Um, that two different things. So the QoS provides you with a set of virtual channels. Those virtual channels you use to build virtual networks. Each of those virtual networks is independent. And each, so you think of this as effectively, you know, if you've got eight virtual channels, you've got eight separate virtual networks. If you've got information on those virtual network, on, on a single virtual network, then they need to arbitrate for an output port. But if you've got information on one virtual network and some other information on another virtual network, they don't need to arbitrate. They will, because they've got allocated bandwidth, so they don't compete. It's only packets that are coming on the same virtual network going to a single output port that need to compete for that. So that's why we've added in this virtual channel capability or virtual network capability. We use virtual channels to build virtual networks. Okay. 
Uh, next question from Mingal Steinbach. I assume that a router would have to announce receiving capability to the sending node via flow control tokens before the wormhole is actually established. Otherwise, it would not be able to determine the outgoing port from the first octet in the packet. What are typical input buffer sizes in routers? Yeah, so what happens here is that the, the flow control is done over the link. So we saw that there's a flow control token that's actually exchanged for a certain number of data, char uh, data characters. So typically in a frame, there's 256 data characters. And that's basically what the size of the flow, a typical flow control token is. So one flow control token, you get 256 data characters. Um, so the size of the buffer, the minimum size of the buffer is basically that, 256 bytes, but it needs to be a bit bigger than that. So of the order of a kilobyte. Um, so that's all you need. The buffers are relatively small. Now, when it comes to, um, so we transfer the information over the link. It arrives at the routing switch because we've given it, um, you know, we've given the flow control token. So it arrives at the routing switch and then we've got the very, the head of, the packet, if you like, has come in the first frame for that uh, packet. That determines which output port we're going to go to. And then we just make that link inside the routing switch. So we don't negotiate uh, a link through the routing switch beforehand. It's when the packet arrives at the routing switch. Then if, if that output port is free, the worm effectively then wiggles through the routing switch. So you don't get a worm negotiating its way through a wormhole. It just digs its way through the network, if you like. OK, uh, time for one more question uh, from David Horn. Is IP available for the for a Xilinx FPGA for creating custom endpoints? Uh, yeah, so um, IP is available. StarDund provides a complete range of IP. So we have uh, single lane, multi lane interfaces. So these are the endpoints. And we have single and multi lane routing. Uh, IP. We also provided uh, bridges between uh, space wire and space fiber so that you can uh, integrate space wire with space fiber networks. Um, that's available for the you know, full range of Xilinx FPGAs, everything from the Spartan 6, if you can buy one nowadays, up to uh, Versal um, uh, FPGA. Um, the, it's also available for the microchip R RTG4, Polar Fire, and so on, and for uh, Nano Explore, and so on. Okay, that's all the questions we have time for. I do see a few more on the Q&A, so I think we'll move those over to Slack. Steve, thank you so much for your time today. You're and welcome. We'll Thanks very so much, Brendan.